Uh, hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Vinura, and I'll be your presenter for the day. Uh, before we start off the webinar, a quick reminder. Uh, make sure that uh, your mics are muted and your video is off so as not to disturb the proceedings of uh, the day. And uh, so the webinar link will be available from 9 a.m. and until 9.50 for everybody to join in. And uh, no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. And uh, each attendee should attend the webinar until the end to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And the CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. Also, a little bit about asking questions. Uh, questions will, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question, uh, make sure to type, type it into the chat box uh, so that uh, we can see it. So make sure to change your settings to all panelists and attendees so that uh, we can answer your questions. And uh, if you uh, have a specific question, please uh, do not hesitate to email us. Uh, so today's uh, webinar will be on, it's an update on STD and HIV. Uh, by Dr. Pumi Pereira, who is the consultant venerologist at uh, the STD clinic Ampara. Uh, so over to you, madam. Okay, hey, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. So should I um, share my screen then? Okay, so um, thank you for giving me this opportunity, actually. So I'll be uh, discussing a little bit about the latest insights on STD HIV and what the doctors uh, need to know uh, in managing them. Okay, so my, what I'll be discussing is the latest epidemiology uh, of the STIs in Sri Lanka and then their common presentations, uh, then the latest HIV trends and the available services and how you all can help us in uh, detecting, diagnosing and managing uh, these sort of patients. Bit of background. Um, so Sri Lanka still is a low prevalent country for HIV the prevalence is less than 0.1%. However, in certain populations and age groups, the trends of HIV is rising. I will go into details when I'm discussing the epidemiology. And in 2022, um, Sri Lanka experienced a notable change in the epidemiology of STIs with a rising trend observed in most infections. And you may be aware that National STDs Control Program is the main institute for the control of STIs and HIV in Sri Lanka. And it is situated at number 29, Disaram Place, Colombo 10. And under the guidance, technical guidance of this program, there are 41 STD clinics island-wide uh, in all the districts which are functioning, sometimes under a consultant or under a medical officer. So coming on to the local epidemiology in STIs, uh, it is somewhat similar to the previous years, whereas genital herpes, non-gonococcal infections, and genital warts consist the main STIs reported during 2022. So among females, what we mostly see are genital herpes and non-gonococcal infections. So under this non-gonococcal infections, the chlamydial infections, mycoplasma infections are included. So we categorize them as non-gonococcal infections. That is, uh, infections caused by other than Neisseria gonorrhea. And then among males, the main things we see is uh, see are like uh, genital warts, syphilis, and gonorrhea. So this is how the trends have been from 2017 to 2022. As you can see, it is always genital herpes which has been uh, uh, reported more and followed by non-gonococcal infections, then genital warts, so, and then syphilis, gonorrhea, and trichomoniasis. So, but you can see in 2020, there was a drop in reported cases because probably because of the, you know, COVID pandemic and then followed by the financial crisis and all that. So people did not come to clinics. So there was a drop. But now again, the trends are rising as the country is getting a little bit normalized. So people are coming back again to the clinics with these infections. So this is how the syphilis cases were reported for the last seven years or so. So in syphilis, you may know that there are two stages, mainly two stages, that is the infectious syphilis and the late syphilis. During the late syphilis, um, the, the, the ability to pass on the infection is actually minimum, but during the infectious syphilis stage, you can pass the infection to another person. 
So usually what we see mostly is the late syphilis stage. However, uh, during the past two or three years, the infectious syphilis rates are also uh, rising among certain populations. So let's look at how these are uh, reported according to the sex. So infectious syphilis, as you can see, has gone, uh, I mean, it has a very marked rise among males since last year. So there's a very uh, sort of a big increase among males uh, with infectious syphilis. Uh, the trends in females have been more or less stable. Again, the trend of gonorrhea, again, is rising among males. Females, it's again stable. However, the non-gonococcal infections, that is like cervicitis, mainly cervicitis, uh, is, um, has always been reported more among females who are more than 25 years of age. Uh, even though we see a drop in the 2020 and 2021, probably because of these uh, issues in the country, the trend is again picking up uh, as usual. Genital herpes, as I mentioned, is more reported among females. And again, uh, the numbers are coming back to the previous years uh, after this uh, drop in 2020 and 2021. Then genital warts caused by human papilloma virus. Uh, reported more among males. However, the females are catching up with the numbers uh, during this year, during the past year. So let's discuss how these STIs are transmitted. You probably know. So STIs are sexually transmitted infections. So basically they transmit via unsafe sexual practices. Uh, so either vaginal, anal or oral, unprotected sex. Then there are some infections that can transmit through mother to child. And then some in, uh, infections can transmit through infected blood. So um, I, as I mentioned, I'll discuss a little bit about the common symptoms for STIs uh, for females and males. For females, what we mostly see are vaginal discharges, increased vaginal discharge, smelly vaginal discharge, and then um, intermittent bleeding, Mm, these can be followed by low abdominal pain, deep dyspareunia, uh, contact bleeding and all that, uh, postcoital bleeding because uh, all these, you know, gonococcal infections, non-gonococcal infections can com uh, complicate, can get complicated with uh, the development of pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, so you will probably see lots of patients with vag increased vaginal discharge. So uh, keep the STI component as well in your mind when you are assessing them. And then uh, they can come with vulval or perianal ulcers and blisters. So usually herpes is a uh, condition where you get vesicles and then they rupture and become very painful ulcers. Uh, and then uh, even uh, the females can get anal discharges as well, which can be caused by gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, then they also can present with vaginal or anal warts. So these are the quite, I mean, the common symptoms. But you have to uh, understand that females are mostly asymptomatic. They would not have any symptom. So that's why we usually make people aware, even in the absence of symptoms, if the person has had high-risk behaviors, they need to get tested. Because around 50% of the females will be asymptomatic. So there's no point in waiting for the symptoms to appear. If a person has undergone a high-risk behavior, sexual behavior, the best thing is to get tested. Again, the common symptoms for males are usually urethral or anal discharge, which can be caused by uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, mycoplasma. And then they can get dysuria frequency, you know, symptoms such as uh, su suggestive of UTIs, but then it may be a STI as well. Then uh, these can uh, cause ascending infection and cause epididyma ochitis, resulting in scrotal pain, tenderness, swelling, and all that. Um, then uh, they also can get penile or anal warts and penile or perianal ulcers and blisters. Uh, again, males can be asymptomatic, but most not as much as females. 
uh, they males can get symptoms uh, more frequently than females however again even in the absence of symptoms they have to uh, get tested uh, if they have undergone a high risk behavior so you may know that some diseases can be completely cured so these are the bacterial infections such as syphilis gonorrhea chlamydia those are the bacterial um, infections and we can completely cure them because they are bacteria so uh, we can completely cure but some diseases we cannot cure we can only control them by treatment so these are mainly caused by viruses so those are for an example like hiv genital warts herpes hep b all these are caused by viruses and we cannot completely cure them we can only effectively control them by treatment so the complications of stis can be sometimes very grave so gonorrhea and chlamydia can cause as i mentioned pelvic inflammatory disease or epididymocytis and then which can lead to infertility subfertility and sometimes uh, there can be disseminated infections causing endocarditis hepatitis and so many uh, end organ damage then um, syphilis is a very i mean there's a saying that if you know syphilis you know medicine because it's like it's affecting all the systems uh, so complications of syphilis can be in the late stages it can cause tertiary syphilis where you can get cardiovascular bone uh, or neurosyphilis in neurosyphilis you can get even eye involvement uh, ear involvement so if you see a patient with sensory neural deafness or any uveitis um, it is always better to check for syphilis as well then uh, hpv you know causes cancers uh, mainly cervical vulval anal and penile cancers and then uh, with herpes the complications are usually vulval adhesions if they do not uh, do the proper management techniques and then some people can get post herpetic neuralgia and then very rarely encephalitis then hepatitis b and c can cause cirrhosis hepatocellular cancer and these complicate i mean and these stis can uh, transmit from mother to child as well so in such situations if gonorrhea or chlamydia was present uh, during the delivery time the baby can end up with ophthalmia neonatura that is a uh, infection of the eyes and so they can get um, conjunctivitis and all that um then uh, syphilis can be transmitted through mother to child um so the baby can end up with congenital syphilis again if the mother is having herpes ulcers at the time of de delivery the babies can end up with neonatal herpes which is actually a, a very deadly condition so if you if you are working in a labor room or a obs ward uh, when you are doing the sort of uh, the vulval or the vaginal examinations look for any Uh, abnormal discharges any presence of ulcers and uh, any warts so that uh, and you can uh, like uh, refer them to us so we can advise on further management then of course these are the physical complications but then there are so much of mental health uh, complications as well there can be the people go into depression when they know that they are having herpes some sometimes they are suicidal and then there can be so much of relationship issues so so many social and mental health related issues complications are also there because of stis then moving on to the local epidemiology of hiv i will uh, explain a little bit about what happens in hiv so you know hiv is a virus uh, so it sort of uh, damages our immune system so this is the timeline actually what happens um, so when you get the infection uh the hiv viral load starts to rise as you can see from this red line and then there's a peak during the initial stage especially during the zero conversion stage zero conversion is you don't have antibodies previously but with the infection you develop antibodies so you are zero converted so during that time there's a drop in the cd4 cells and the viral load is very high and with time the patient becomes symptomless they can go symptomless for up to 10 8 to 10 years or so but during this time the cd4 counts get destroyed so the numbers are going down then 
once the numbers are very low, so let's say it's around 200, the usual CD4 count is around 800 or more. But with HIV, the CD4 counts can go below 200 cells per microliter. Then they become symptomatic and then we call it, uh, if the CD4 count is less than 200, we call it the AIDS stage. So unless we intervene, uh, they will die. So it might take around 8 to 10 years for the patient to go into AIDS stage. During that time, they may be sim there may be symptoms, they may, they may have like non-specific symptoms, but still, because of the viral load, they have a viral load, and they will be infectious throughout this 8 to 10 years, unless they are on treatment. So that is what happens. So there's a timeline where they develop antibodies. Antibodies might take around 2 to 3 months to develop. Antigens can develop within uh, after two weeks of the infection, the, the 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 test with the shortest window period is the viral load, where you can detect HIV within seven days of infection. So the viral load is, as I mentioned, is very high during the very initial stage, and then it comes to a plateau because the body fights against the virus without any medication, and then the body tries to keep it under control. However, when the CD4 counts drops, the body cannot handle anymore. So then again, the viral load rises. So during the AIDS stage and the early infection stage, the viral load is high. So they are more infectious during the very early stages as well as when they're in the AIDS stage. So now we are at the highest ever total number of people living with HIV worldwide. It is around 38 million according to the UNH by 2020. So this is actually because you all know, you must be aware that there is treatment for HIV. So now people are not dying of HIV. They are living with the virus. So once HIV was used to know, used to be known as a deadly disease, but now it is known as a sort of a controllable uh, chronic infection. So moving on to Sri Lanka, by the end of 2022, around 4,100 People living with HIV are estimated to be in Sri Lanka. However, only around 86% know their status. So, there's a, there are around like, let's say around 600 people who have not tested and who do not know that they have HIV. So, they are not in our services. So, once they get tested, we link them into our clinics, but only 84% are in our services. So, there's this gap where they get tested, but they do not come to the services. So. As a program, what we are trying to do is reduce these gaps. So all the 4,100 people will be in our care. So that's where we all need help from you all as well. Because by increasing testing and once they are tested positive to link to care. Again, as in the STI trends, uh, HIV also showed a decline during 2020 probably because of COVID. However, in 2022, uh, it was the highest number reported in Sri Lanka. So 607 new HIV cases were reported in Sri Lanka in 2022. And this year, by uh, now the second quarter is over, uh, at the end of the second quarter, 347 people are tested positive. So probably this year, we will go beyond 700. So gender distribution wise, there's a very big difference among males and females. It's actually seven to one. So seven males to one female. So actually males are uh, contributing mostly to the HIV epidemic in Sri Lanka. This is the actually the alarming sort of slide. The number of HIV diagnosis among young people, that is 15 to 24 years of age, seems to be rising. So in 2022, 73 people who were uh, out of 607 uh, were reported in the ages of 15 to 24 years. Even though the percentage may be stable, the numbers are rising. So it is actually quite alarming because they but personally what i've seen is 
um, quite educated males coming uh, in their very early 20s with HIV infection. Then there was this uh, change, especially among the drug users, IV drug users, where we only had one or two during the previous years. But in 2022, there were 10 who reported IV drug use. Eight of them had two sort of risk behaviors, such as they have male-to-male -male sex as well as IV drug use. So the issue is, if the HIV infection is um, introduced to an IV drug user population, it will spread like wildfire because it is transmitted through blood by sharing needles. So, so sharing needles has a very high risk compared to sexual transmission. So it will spread very much faster if uh, HIV is, in, uh, is introduced into the IV drug user population. So we have to be very much careful uh, and must take preventive measures to uh, stop this transmission. So this is how the people who were diagnosed with HIV reported their modes of transmission. So 52% of them had male-to-male -male sexual exposures. Then 34% had heterosexual exposures and 13% uh, did not report any uh, mode of transmission. So I suppose this will be quite uh, useful as doctors for you to know the available HIV testing and how to sort of uh, refer them to us. So initially, we what we, I mean, even now, what we are doing is we test the HIV test using an antigen antibody ELISA as a screening test. And if it is positive, we go for the Western blot. But now the WHO has uh, advised to use the rapid tests, the three rapid test algorithm, because then that alleviates the need for the Western blot and the time consumed because Western blot takes around one or two weeks for the, uh, for the report to come. But then with the rapid test, it only takes around 20 minutes. So with that, we can confirm the patients then and there. And so the link into care, you may remember that even though we diagnose the patient, there is a gap in linking them into our services. So what we plan to do with these three rapid tests is we plan to link them to our care uh, on the day itself that they get diagnosed. So, so that the loss to follow-up rate will be less. Then there's this other, I mean, we are rolling out more and more self, I mean, like HIV testing uh, mechanisms because we need to uh, test all the people who are having high-risk behaviors so that we can identify all those 4,100 people. So self-testing is now introduced. So it is they, the, the person who wants a self-test, they can order it online and what they have to do is they just have to take some um, oral fluids from the gums and uh, they can do the test at home by themselves. So there will be a, so then uh, they can, if it is positive, they can contact us and come to our services. So these tests are actually um, rolled out through this web-based uh, mechanism and it is known as knowforsure.lk. So that's a web, uh, web page where the person can go and choose the language. I will show the web page later. They can choose the language and then they can book an appointment. They can even do it anonymously. They don't have to put their real name, um, uh, book an appointment or order and self-test, or they can uh, discuss their worries with a, a service provider online. Then uh, if you are working in the... Uh, MOHs or um, like antenatal, like gene and OBS wards, you may know that we are screening all the antenatal mothers during their first trimester so that we can prevent mother-child transmission of HIV, uh, which is actually a life-saving uh, uh, life saving thing. Then HIV treatment-wise, I will not go much into details, but there have been so many changes in the uh, in the landscape of uh, ART, that is antiretroviral treatment. So initially they started with uh, treating them with one drug. Then uh, now the combination treatment came in 20 2005 where we are giving 
three drugs as a combined pill. Then now uh, the developed world, even us, we are also now sometimes using dual therapy for people who are having a, a stable condition where their viral load is undetectable and so on. So the concepts have changed a bit. Usually we waited till the CD4 counts dropped to a certain level to start them on treatment. But now, as soon as they are diagnosed, we treat them all. We treat them then and there. So what is now recommended is to start antiretroviral treatment on the same day, if possible. Then, as I mentioned, um, we are at the moment still using the triple drug combinations, but dual drug combinations can also be used in certain situations where the patient is stable and uh, the viral load is undetectable and the adherence is good. So we can change them into dual drug regime. Uh, so we so this is actually introduced because then the kill burden is reduced as well as the side effects profile is also better when compared to a triple drug treatment. Then uh, in the developed world, they are now going into long acting injectables where the patient can take the antiretroviral medication as a injectable once a month or once in two months. So the pill burden is reduced. Um, I mean, so many, I mean, it, the quality of life is far more better than taking a pill a day when compared to taking an injectable once a month. So, and then the other thing is treatment as prevention. So we give antiretroviral treatment for an HIV positive person for two reasons, actually. One is to control their HIV and stop the disease progression and stop them from dying. The other thing is, once their virus is completely controlled and their viral load is undetectable, they cannot further transmit sexually. So that is called treatment as prevention. So then this concept came out, which is called undetectable equals untransmittable. That is, the, if the patient's viral load is undetectable, he cannot transmit it to someone else. So this has changed a lot for the HIV, so for the people living with HIV, because now uh, the stigma and everything can be ad addressed through this because, I mean, stigma happens when people are scared of themselves getting HIV. But now if the patient is having an undetectable viral load, they cannot transmit it to anyone else. HIV prevention wise, there have been a lot of changes in Sri Lanka. So these are the usual methods that we follow. Safe sex counseling. So we try to advise them to stick to one partner, uh, to the regular or the married partner. Um, and if that is not possible, and especially for the young people, we advise them to abstain from sex till, um, till they get married or, you know, uh, during a certain, I mean, till a certain point in time is achieved, uh, especially for the, you know, the school going people. And then um, for the older people, we, I mean, the young adults or the elderly, elderly in the sense like 20s people, we uh, educate them on condoms and lubricants to use them consistently and correctly. And then the new things are pre exposure prophylaxis. So pre-exposure prophylaxis is something like taking contraception. So either you can take this daily or as an event-based uh, way. So these are given for high-risk populations such as MSMs. MSMs are the males who have sex with males or IV drug users or transgender women who have high-risk sexual exposures or HIV zero discordant couples. Uh, where the partner is HIV, I mean, the viral load is not suppressed. So pre-exposure prophylaxis is now recommended to be taken as a very good effective method to prevent HIV. Then post-exposure prophylaxis is also present, is available, especially following occupational exposure or even for a non-occupational exposure. Um, then as I mentioned, treatment as prevention. Then active management of HIV in pregnancy. So that is done. So we treat all the pregnant mothers with HIV with antiretroviral treatment and uh, so many uh, methods. I mean, we liaise with the uh, the, the, the OPS team so that uh, the 
child will not get HIV. So a bit in detail about PrEP. So as I mentioned, it is given for the MSMs, transgender women, IV drug users, and serodiscordant HIV couples where the partner is having a, a detectable viral load. So PrEP, at the moment in Sri Lanka, we are giving it as a tablet. So it's an oral PrEP. It can be taken either daily or even based. Then uh, in other countries, long-acting injectables is also recommended as PrEP, which can be taken as a once-a-month injection. Then Pepsi. Pepsi is post-exposure prophylaxis following sexual exposure. And then OPEP is post-exposure prophylaxis following occupational exposure. Probably you must have heard of these because most of you must have, maybe some of you must have undergone needle prick injuries. So what you have to know is if you face a needle prick injury or a mucosal splash, just come with the blood sample of the patient to the STD clinic as soon as possible because we need to assess you and start the post-exposure prophylaxis as soon as possible and at least within 72 hours of exposure. After 72 hours, the effect is not there. So in some areas, what we see is the healthcare worker only send the blood sample to the STD clinic. Sometimes they don't even mention that this is a uh, blood from the source patient following occupational exposure. Then what happens is the testing gets delayed and then the, this window for action is gone. So then we cannot do anything. So if you face whatever the uh, occupational exposure, take the blood sample from the patient and come to the STD clinic. If it is after hours, so STD clinics are not there after four o'clock. So, but there'll be a consultant in the district uh, or the MOIC, you can call them and get their advice. So, because now you will see a lot of HIV positive patients in the wards because now, as I mentioned, they are, they, it, this is a chronic infection now. They are living with HIV because of the treatment. And Pepsi, that is post-exposure prophylaxis following sexual exposure, can be offered following sexual abuse or a high-risk sexual exposure. So this needs to be also started within 72 hours. So if you see a patient with following a sexual abuse, think of this as well. And uh, I know they are being uh, referred to the STD clinics through the JMO. Uh, so try to do it within 72 hours so that we can again assess them and offer Pepsi if necessary. So if we start Pepsi or post-exposure prophylaxis following occupational exposure, you will need to take treatment for 28 days for it to be effective. Then a bit about how uh, what has happened with this uh, program on prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. So with the help of the other uh, maternal and child health program in Sri Lanka, and all these uh, gin and OBS, uh, sections, we were able to receive the WHO certification in 2019 for elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis. However, there will be a revalidation cycle in 2024. And if you see a mother who have undergone, who has undergone stillbirth or a miscarriage, please do an HIV test if they have not undergone a HIV test because Stillbirth or miscarriage can be because of the HIV per se. So just every time check all these mothers whether they have undergone HIV testing and syphilis testing. And if you suspect that this may be a person who may be having high risk behaviors or the partner may be having high risk behaviors, it's always good to retest them at the trimester as well. So these are actually my the, the last sections of my talk. How can you help us? So as you can see, there are a few gaps we need to fill uh, by to like, we need to identify who are positive and then to link them to care. So you will probably see patients with HIV indicator conditions or AIDS defining conditions. So usually HIV indicator conditions are like pyrexia of unknown origin, um, severe anemia, thrombocytopenias or any cytopenias, and then recurrent infections, recurrent bacterial pneumonias, um, 
resistantinias and all that these are like sort of indicator conditions where you have to test for hiv then aids defining conditions such as i mean pulmonary tb is not not a aids defining condition but all the tb patients have to undergo hiv testing you must be aware of that and then extra pulmonary tb is considered as a aids defining condition and then there are like opportunistic infections such as toxoplasma cryptococcal meningitis um cmv infections cmv retinitis especially so if you work in a um i ward you will you if you see a patient with retinitis cmv related must check for hiv and then there are lymphomas um hiv wasting syndrome chronic diarrhea all these you have to during all these uh, conditions have a high suspicion on uh, hiv and test them because we've seen some patients being uh, have not undergone testing even with, even though they've come with these sort of infections or conditions and after only several admissions they have been tested for hiv and as i mentioned please make sure all antenatal mothers have undergone hiv testing and if necessary repeat test at third trimester in high risk women the other thing that you can uh, you have to know is the availability of post exposure prophylaxis following an occupational exposure and remember this timeline it must be started within 72 hours after that there's no point i've seen nurses coming after 72 hours doctors coming after 72 hours but after that there is nothing much we can do so if you undergo even a small prick injury come to the std clinic with the blood sample of the patient even if the uh, if there is no patient and you got a needle prick injury by, by a needle just lying around that is fine come to the std clinic so that we can give you advice and then um some people do not come to these clinics especially the people who are having hiv because they are like they are very scared that they will be stigmatized they are go they are scared to go into the uh, hospitals and get admitted thinking that they will be stigmatized or discriminated and all that uh, now actually most of our healthcare workers are behave i mean have learned uh, about how to behave professionally and not to stigmatize so stigma is actually going down still in some areas it is there so we have to improve ourselves so that zero stigma and discrimination uh, can be achieved at all settings because then only the people who are sort of you know hiding in the society who are scared to come out will come out to the services and get tested and take treatment unless everyone is safe all of us will be not safe because in some way or the other there will be uh we will be at risk at some point in time if people go into hiding so in sri lanka and in the in the unh targets are to end the aids epidemic by 2030 so we are working towards that goal uh by increasing the opportunities for hiv testing by reducing stigma and making available art treatment for everyone and uh, at the moment we are having uh, the same sort of regimes given in european countries so we are having very quality treatment in sri lanka as well so these are the important websites you can use actually so this national std aids control program we have this uh, website you can just google national std aids control program and uh, it will direct you to this website so there are so many statistics we actually we update our statistics quarterly and uh, you can Uh, get all the resource material from the website all our guidelines updated guidelines are also available online and then whatever the forms you need also for any reporting it will be there in this website and then the other one as i mentioned knowforsure.lk this is where the clients can use to assess their own risk for hiv and book a safe and confidential anonymous hiv test or Uh, an hiv std or hiv clinic appointment through this website so if you are 
if you come across anyone who you think will need a test or if they are not willing to come to clinics, you can direct them to this website where they can either get a self-test or can get uh, advice anonymously through this um, uh, no for sure not LK. So that is actually my um, presentation. I'm happy to answer questions and we can have a bit more discussion. And my contact details are given. If you need any uh, in an emergency or whatever the issues you face, you can call me if necessary. Uh, Thank madam, you. Uh, there are some questions. Yes. Uh, shall I start? Okay. Uh, yeah. The first one is uh, what's the life expectation after mm -hmm. the CD4 count drops below 200? Yeah, so actually um, some people do live up even after that. Like some people do live 5 or 10 years if they take treatment properly. But the issue is after uh, CD4 count drops to 200, uh, some people are having very severe opportunistic infections. So... Um, it will depend on the opportunistic infection that they have. So if they do not have much of a uh, severe opportunistic infection, um, they can anyway live up to the normal, near normal life ex expectancy if they start treatment and uh, is adherent properly. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. The next question, uh, can you elaborate on the timing of rapid test after exposure? Yeah, so rapid test can be uh, antigen antibody based or antibody based per se. So if it is antigen antibody, you can test uh, after two weeks of the exposure. But if it is negative, you might have to wait till you repeat it after three months because uh, some people can go up to three months to develop antibodies. Antigens usually come up in maybe like after two weeks time from the last sexual exposure. If it is just a rapid antibody-based rapid test, uh, for us to say it is negative, we might have to wait for three months. Okay. The next question is, what's the percentage of transmission of HIV and Hep B after a needle prick injury? Yeah. Hep B has the highest transmission rates. It is 30% actually. And hepatitis C, only 3%. Whereas HIV, it's 0.3%. So HIV has the lowest rate. However, hepatitis B has the highest rate. And I hope everyone of you have undergone hepatitis B vaccination and have tested for hepatitis B surface antibody levels. Test them. And if it is low, if it is less than 10, that means you will need another round of uh, vaccination. Okay, and the next question is what's the test to prescribe for to test to prescribe to screen HIV for suspected person or pregnant mother, uh, whether it's a HIV rapid test or HIV PCRs uh, or HIV viral load and how to uh, monitor the response during treatment. Yeah, so the best thing is but in the pregnancy what we do is uh, we send all the blood to the STD clinics. So if you see a pregnant mother who has not undergone um, HIV testing through the MOHS, then what you have to do is do a HIV uh, 1 and 2 antigen antibody ELISA and try your best to send the mother to MOH clinics so that they can uh, do the, uh, the, the, they can do the HIV testing algorithm according to the given guidelines. And, um, so in certain conditions, in certain situations, we might do the viral load if the ELISA is sort of having a weak reaction and we cannot exclude HIV properly from the screening test, we might do the viral load to confirm the uh, testing, sorry, confirm the infection. And monitoring is done by, if it is the, if the mother is positive, monitoring is done by the HIV viral load. Uh, Madam, to add to that, uh, uh, that's a question asking whether doctors can prescribe uh, uh, for post uh, pre exposure prophylaxis of HIV or whether they have to go to the CD clinics for uh, be prescribed. Yeah, so the, the thing is, uh, at the moment, these are all antiretroviral medications. So these are not available in other uh, pharmacies or in the private sector. So these are only available through STD clinics. So if uh, 
so usually the uh, i mean the only the medical officers working in the std clinics or the venerologists can prescribe prep or pepsi uh, <clears throat> uh the last question ma'am uh, if there is a opportunistic infection at the time of diagnosis how do we decide on the timing of uh, heart treatment so that actually depends on the opportunistic infection if it is very very low like you know the cd4 count is very low and if it is let's say tb meningitis we might have to uh, defer heart uh, for a certain time period maybe like at least two weeks but apart from that um, also if it is cryptococcal meningitis again we will have to sort of defer starting ART medications but apart from that we try to start uh, what what is recommended is starting ART as soon as possible. There's another question: What are the drugs oh. used for gonorrhea and chlamydia? So in gonorrhea, what we do is uh, so if it is uncomplicated gonorrhea, what we give is a uh, oral cefexib stat dose, and if it is a complicated gonorrhea such as PID or pseudomyocarditis or if there is local complications or if it is pharyngeal um, pharyngeal gonorrhea, we will have to give. I am keftriaxone. For chlamydia, at the moment, the recommended drug is doxycycline. So there's a direct message to me asking, does fellatio cause transmission? Yes. Oral sex can cause HIV transmission, gonorrhea transmission, uh, chlamydia transmission. Yeah. Rapid test ELISA both are the same? No. Rapid test is different. ELISA is different. So it depends on the, you know, the lab technique. So those are not the same. But the, the components that they look at can be the same, like antigen, antibody. That's uh, another question. Uh, there's a sing whether there's a single pill stat regime for post-exposure prophylaxis. Whether there is a single pill stat regime for post-exposure prophylaxis. So there's no stat regime. Single pill, yes, because we give a combination uh, drug. Like there are sometimes, there are. it depends on the combination though. If it is like... Uh, so some pills contain three drugs in the single pill. Some uh, regimes contains, we might have to give two pills. So, but there's no stat regime. You have to take 28 days. There is another one, uh, management of asymptomatic children with positive HIV. So it is the same as in, uh, as for adults, they need to take HIV medications and retroviral treatment lifelong. There's another one asking if someone, um, someone having a, uh, HIV, is it possible to migrate to another country? Well, it depends on the country. You know, some countries, you know, maybe like Middle East, they might not uh, allow you to come. But in other countries, yes, you can go. Um, so they here they were asked, uh, after a needle prick injury, she was asked to come six weeks to check the sample. What's the reason? So again, it is to cover the window period. So usually we check uh, on the day of the needle prick, we check. Uh, your baseline HIV, then after six weeks, we again check. And then after three months from the exposure, we check. So that is to sort of cover the window period and uh, for us not to miss the uh, miss any zero conversions. Vaccination in HIV positive patient is actually another full um, lecture, I suppose. So if, you, if the patient is very severely immunocompromised, then we do not advise uh, for them to undergo any live vaccines. So that is the basics of that, but uh, it is actually a very vast area. I don't think I can cover everything uh, at this moment. Madam, I think the questions are done. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for uh, answering all these questions and uh, providing this update on the STD and HIV. Thank you, three, isn't it? For, yes, um, yeah, for inviting me and uh, yeah. So if any one of you has any issues or any concerns, you can use my numbers or my email and uh, contact me whenever you want.